You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for February 15th, 2019. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Twitter jail conjugal visit trailer, it's the professional left with Drip Glass and Blue Gal. I'm in jail again, Blue Gal. Yeah, the second time in our marriage, Drip Glass is in Twitter jail again. Your mother warned you about men like me. Dad and mom told me. Yeah. That you were a ne'er do well. No, they didn't. There's only room for 140 characters in the conjugal visit trailer. That's right. So. That's right. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, and this is a special anniversary for us. It is. We, we seem to always have lots of anniversaries because we are that way. But uh, 11 years ago today, we are recording this on February 15th. And 11 years ago today, I officially met Driftglass face to face at a Shakespeare sister meetup in Evanston, Illinois. Yes, indeed. It was in an Irish restaurant, as I recall. The basement of an Irish restaurant. That figures. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The basement of an Irish uh, beer beer and food joint. And it was an evening. And uh, I noticed after that evening was over that you never left my side. The one once you arrived, you sat next to me and you didn't leave. So I kind of noticed that. (laughs) And we have known each other pretty well from... uh... From yeah, from salon. salon and from which was a live chat room that I ran every Monday night for a while. And mm-hmm. yeah, we had known each other uh, to type and to talk and to read each other's blogs right. professionally. And we would link each other and that sort of thing. So we were fans of each other's writings. It wasn't total strangers, you know, no. trying to get to know one another. It was more no. catching up. But uh, you look very nice, Drift Glass. Well, and you uh, you, apparently you thought I looked nice too. So I, I did. Apparently. And, uh, yes. Last night we had a beautiful Valentine's Day dinner that you prepared. And yeah. thank you for that. And thank you for, for the two Valentines you gave me. I gave you a fat lot of nothing, but. Oh, please. Appreciation for all you did for me. <laughs> oh, please. I look around my home and I look at, I see nothing but gifts. But we were sitting there eating dinner in the dining room and uh youngest child comes in and. Uh, starts asking us about the history of our relationship. And, you know, some of the things we leave out when we explain to youngest child what it is that yes. uh, happened and transpired. But uh, she, she for the first time, asked who made the first move. Yeah. And I thought, oh, boy, she's maturing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, Drift Glass never... made the first move. If you ever get that in a trivia question, yeah, Drift Glass definitely made the first move. I made the first move. I did indeed. <laughs> I put a smiley face on one of my texts, and that was, <laughs> the rest was history. Right there. Yeah. Flirting and flirting and flirting. Well, all, all I ever wanted from blogging was a uh, uh, beautiful woman, liquor, and and money. And I got all those things. So You did. You got all I've those gotten... things in, in various quantities. I did. One woman. Several bottles of scotch and a, a little bit of money to get oh, by. And, and now I'm starting my uh, Twitter legal defense fund. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm planning on adding a Roger stack Roger Stone, that. eat your heart out. Yeah. <laughs> and your peanut butter sandwiches. Uh, poor Roger Stone now has a gag order on him as of this afternoon. Oh, poor Roger Stone. And uh, everyone is predicting he's going to last about two days before he's in contempt of court. Yep. Uh and he, uh, we have at Crooks and Liars, um, I love having archives. We have, I hate, and I hate to promote anything associated with Alex Jones, but this clip is so telling. It is Alex Jones and, and Roger Stone, both huge Trump fans, just before the Republican National Convention in 2016. And the efforts the weak efforts of never Trumpers to try to stop Trump from becoming the nominee. And both of them are freaking out about this and saying, if they try to stop Trump, we're going to wear ball gags in protest. Yes. That that won't send a mixed message of any kind. No. (laughs) And I thought that that segued very nicely into your Twitter jail uh, discussion as well. I'm I'm, I'm Um, back in Twitter jail. 
I had a um, a lovely conversation with uh, youngest child, by the way. I, I was running errands yesterday and had to take her someplace and then bring her back from someplace. So, And we always have a pretty good chat in the car, mm-hmm. um, yeah. j- just about stuff. And her vocabulary is a lot more sophisticated than it was even a year ago. And mm-hmm. just, just she thinks in a much more subtle and interesting way. And she, for example, wanted to know about marijuana laws. Oh. Uh, why why the hell is pot illegal? Yeah. It's not, it's yeah. not because I, I'm carrying a stash or anything. She no. really wanted to know because she has friends. Um, and she notices that, for example, uh, African-American people tend to get locked up at much, much higher rates and serve much longer sentences than white people. And yeah, those are yeah. her friends, not people who right. go to jail. But that's the community that she hangs out in most often. And right. she, notices- she, she of all the of the whole family yeah. uh, has integrated herself into the African-American community at school. Yeah. And uh, nearly all of the friends that she brings home with her uh, are uh, mixed race or black. So mm-hmm. uh, and, and part of that is the school environment that she's in. And part of it is her personality yeah. and what she perceives to be worthy of. Uh, her attention and yeah. time, and I'm I'm very proud of her. But yeah, she is also very interested in racial fairness, social and, justice, and uh, racial social fairness. justice, yep. and, yeah, and gender. And her brother is, I think, uh, if he doesn't go find a presidential candidate and and start working in politics that way, will wind up an advocate for um, pot legalization because that's a really big interest of his it right is. now. It's just highly, <laughs> highly focused. As a sophomore in college, okay. yes. Uh, no, no comment. But, we, but I, um, I was dropping her off, and and she asked me yeah. why is it basically booze legal, cigarettes legal, but pot not? What's the deal? And I, I, I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll be back in an hour to pick you up. Why don't you tell me three reasons you think it is, and then we'll have a talk about what you know what I think it is, and we'll, we'll you know it's a teachable moment, blue gal. Um, my, right. my parenting is showing. It was it was transparently. Mm-hmm. Hey, here's an after school special just waiting to happen. <laughs> um, and we went through the whole thing about, you know, alcohol has a big lobby and, and tobacco has a big lobby and they're really competition. And there's a bunch of blue nose people out there who just think it's terrible, even though prohibition has proven it doesn't work. But we settled on uh, blue laws. Those laws that are kept on the books in a lot of cases, just so police will have an excuse to arrest whoever the fuck they want to arrest. Uh, you know, uh, uh, transient laws, vagrancy laws, panhandling, uh, jaywalking, mopery and dopery, I believe it used to be called, and possession of marijuana. Because one of the things she pointed out was how come is it, a white kid will get a slap on the wrist and a black kid will go to jail for whatever, for some length of time. And I had to explain to her that some laws are kept on the books in order to be selectively enforced. And the reason that they're selectively enforced is that there are some people they just want to arrest. They want to hassle those people over there. And I drew, I didn't draw then, and I it's, it's a tortured comparison, but that's the reason Twitter rules are the way they are. Yeah, uh, right. Twitter codes of conduct are universally violated by lots and lots and lots of people. And I have been tossed in Twitter jail twice now. Um, I've been banned for a week. As of today, I've, I'm gone from Twitter for a week. The first time I was kicked off of Twitter, it was for calling Bill Maher a whore on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. W-H-O-R-E. Like, you can't take that. <laughs> well, first of all, he uses worse language on Twitter himself. Yeah. And it's not an exactly uncommon term to be used. And I was using it in a very specific context. And I, I dredged up comments that he personally had made that were far worse than that. And it's like, where the hell is this coming from? Mm-hmm. And today mm-hmm. I was banned for using the word gimp. As G-I-M-P. In, yep, as in yep. the very, very famous, specifically, uh, and along with a graphic showing Lindsey Graham in a hood with a zipper on it, to be used in the context of the pulp fiction scene. The very, very famous pulp fiction scene. And they 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 uh, they banned me for a week. Um, and I, I appealed it. We'll see where that goes. I might be off Twitter forever. But I just started looking up, you know, I wonder who else uses this. Everybody uses this term. I found out there's that, one person very specifically yeah. who has used it a lot. Yeah, apparently, um, uh, never Trump hero and the person who I'm supposed to be friendly with from now until the day I die because he's my new best friend, Rick Wilson, mm-hmm. uses the word "gimp" constantly. Yep. In specifically in the same context, I did. The, he does. The first yeah. I, I didn't look very hard, but the first version I found was him describing um, Barack Obama being put into a gimp suit by Vladimir Putin from 2013. 
So he's been using it over and over and over and over and over again. And but he's the difference is that he's a blue check. Yeah. yeah. He's a media yeah. person. He has a book publisher. He's welcome on television. He says all the things I said, you know, 10 years ago, but he, and and he says them for money on television and on the radio and uh on and he's the fr he's a friend of all of uh, uh liberal allies everywhere. So it doesn't matter what he says on Twitter. He's never ever going to be banned from Twitter. Right. Um and clearly something is weird about the the way those rules are enforced because there is no way on fucking earth that I should be kicked off of there if they're in any way serious about those rules. So obviously they're not. They're there to keep uh kick people like me in the balls every now and then to remind me of my place. That's in one side. Mm -hmm. On the other side, um the non sequitur cartoon was yeah, just the political dropped. cartoon, right. Yeah. Was just dropped by my local paper. And several and I, other local papers. And a bunch yes. of local papers. <laughs> because in a in a uh, scrawled drawing of a bear acting as Da Vinci and drawing a bunch of pictures of, about human flight, a bunch of sort of pseudo Da Vinci like sketches, which are made of scribbles for the most part. In one of the scribbles, it said pretty clearly, fuck you, Donald Trump. Very clear. I, I didn't think yeah. it was hidden at all. But no. once yeah. you know where to look and what to look for, it's very clear what, what's there. And that was dropped immediately from the paper. Now, mind you, the same paper carries the most unbelievably offensive ads uh, by right wing um, comic drawers of you know, just the worst shit you see from crazy Uncle Liberty. But they don't, it doesn't use offensive language, it just use offensive imagery. And that's apparently legitimate and perfectly OK. My point is not what's offensive and what's not. Um, my point was simply. You need to understand the difference between the First Amendment and the government and corporations. Mm -hmm. We yeah. all are, theoretically have protections, uh, limited protections, mind you, but protections against government interfering with our speech. That's what the First Amendment means. That's all it means. Corporations can tell you whatever the hell they want and take away your speech from their platforms, whatever they choose. And the local newspaper can choose to put Hugh Hewitt in as a columnist, which they did today. They can choose to syndicate Ann Coulter, which they did today, who, who are manifestly more dangerous to our democracy right. and more per offensive to decent people than any fuck you cartoon or any mention of the word gimp on Twitter. But they have made a corporate decision that the people who pay for their newspaper need to see this or they'll drop their subscription and then they'll go out of business. That's yeah, corporate and decision. I think there is a difference between the cartoonist's uh, decision and your decision because oh, yeah. when you yeah. typed that tweet, you had no idea that even a someone who is prejudiced against you right. would see that as an opportunity to ban you. Right. Whereas the cartoonist writing fuck you, Donald Trump, you know, in, in a scrolly language – in a Font. deliberately hidden way. Right. Right. In a slightly hidden way. But, you know, now knowing that I was looking for it, it wasn't hidden. Right. Uh, he knew the job he was hired to do. Of course. And what mm -hmm. that might cost him. I I would hope he would. And it was much more um, blatant <laughs> yeah. uh, than, you know, the cartoonist in The New Yorker and in, in – a New York Review of Books, I think he is also who hides his daughter's name in the car and writes Nina in right. the in the his drawings. You know that's subtle. That requires a little bit of looking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this didn't require a lot of looking and was no. a clearly over the line statement that you would say if somebody sees this out in the hinterland in a syndicated newspaper where they bought my cartoon to place it in the paper yep. that's going to offend some people yes it will and you, you should be conscious of that yeah. as a cartoonist i would be yeah. i would be as an artist you know as somebody who does photoshops and somebody something if i if i put fuck you donald trump at the and i might very well do that <laughs> at the mm -hmm. bottom of my work and some mainstream publication wasn't expecting that and put it in the paper I would expect to be fired. Yeah. So. But you, but, but here's the difference. Not, not the difference. Here's, here's the distinction. You would be fired because you violated corporate policy. Exactly. Not because you violated the first amendment. Right. 
Right. Exactly. That is exactly. a corporate decision right. made on, on the, I mean, the stuff that the onion says, mm-hmm. you know, the stuff that uh, Wong Ket routinely publishes, you couldn't publish in the mainstream newspaper. Right. Right. You just couldn't. Right. And because they're satire and because they, that's their interior policy. But it, there is a massive difference between um, corporate rules and that's what the newspaper operates under. That's what Twitter operates under. Yeah. Twitter, yeah. Twitter rules of conduct exist so they can be selectively enforced against people they don't like. Right. Right. And I, and I can beat my my breast and scream out loud about how unfair my treatment is. I think it it is patently unfair. That's fine. That's yep. their right. Right. But I, that limits the my ability to communicate with my audience pretty drastically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this was taken away from me on purpose, I think, to teach me a lesson. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know by who or what, you know, that those things are a little, little, but it, the reason the rules exist are so they can be selectively enforced um, in exactly this way. Uh, when I uh, worked at Columbia College, uh, one of the provosts there had special rules written into the student handbook that permitted him to smoke in his office and drink with undergrads. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which are flagrantly, but it was like under, it's like you have your own little ambassadorial zone, you know, this little diplomatic area, which is not technically part of the college. And he can get away with doing whatever the fuck he wants to do because he wanted to do these things, but they were against the rules, but we're going to carve out a special set of rules so that when you're in this particular space, those rules don't apply that those rules weren't invented because they needed to be invented. They were invented to accommodate the personal preferences of one person. And that's what corporate rules are. They are they are written on behalf of the shareholders, on behalf of the uh, the stakeholders, on behalf of the readers, on behalf of you know whoever whoever is running the company. That's what those rules are there to protect. The problem is when you announce to the public that these are the rules by which we will allow the public to participate in this universe. It gets really weird when. One person is kicked off the tennis court for saying something once, and one person is never touched for saying it a thousand right. times. Right. So that's the end of my Twitter dialogue. I'll see y'all in a week. Uh, this is that is literally the least important thing that happened. Well, last, but it's personal to us, days. so it, it yeah. comes up in the front of the show. Uh, more news. Uh, we will be. Uh, we are scheduled to be, I should say. Things things can change, but we are scheduled at the moment to be on the Bob Suska show next week. And we're so yes, excited we about that. Uh, Unless I got banned from that too. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. But, you know, things do change in schedules. Just uh, check local listings. Let's put it that way to make sure that uh, that happens. But we're excited about that. We're scheduled to be on the show on the 20th. And uh, happy Valentine's Day. And thank you for such a lovely Valentine's Day, Drift Glass. I deeply appreciate My all pleasure. you did for me. Um we want to talk about a documentary we watched this week. It's on HBO and it's on demand and so forth. Now, um, the Won't You Be My Neighbor documentary about um, Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Fred Rogers. Yeah. and um, Amazing. It's it was amazing. It was very good. And mm-hmm. I felt chided by it as though I am not living up to the Fred Rogers standard of behavior in my politics. Um, and I felt as though, uh, you know, he, he comes across as so very good. And then you hear from so many people know that he really is like that. He really was like that. He really was that kind Uh of person who was a minister who, uh, treated everyone with respect and was very gentle with children and listened to everybody felt that everyone had value, uh, and that, uh, so much of what is going on in our society and culture. And of course, you know, a lot of this was before Trump, he died recently. Uh, Uh But he felt that, you know, one of the problems we have in society today is people aren't listened to and don't feel that they're being listened to. And so what also happened this week, we watched that on Monday night. And what Mm -hmm. also happened this week is uh, some MAGA, they called it a, a MAGA unit dysfunction on Twitter, <laughs> which was kind of funny. But uh, a man in um, the Midwest at a breakfast shop uh, got very upset, lost it, and started violently screaming at several people in the restaurant, uh, fuck you Democrats. 
And going up to people and women in particular, the two people I noticed him walking right up to their face and screaming, fuck you, Democrats, were both women. Uh, And he also was screaming about, I have a five-year-old, I have another such and such year old, and fuck you, Democrats, fuck you, Democrats. And, of course, it was a phone, camera phone, you know, moment moment all over social media. And... I thought about that in light of the Fred Rogers documentary, and I thought, you know, there but for the grace of God go I screaming about Republicans, that there are days where that's how I want to behave. That's how the id inside of me wants to scream at Republicans uh, without giving reason and feeling it perfectly justified in doing so. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that and whether um, – and and not – have an hour of justifying my feelings or my behavior, but to really think about and discuss with you, Drift Glass, because I trust you, mm-hmm. how uh, we go about, d- and I don't want this to turn into a be best conversation either, because <laughs> the hypocrisy of of yeah. that whole movement is, is certainly is keyed into this conversation. Right. But right. a third thing that I will add uh, to this is I recommend that everybody go to YouTube and watch Stacey Abrams, who was on Seth Meyers on Thursday night, Valentine's Day. She was on yeah. Seth Meyers and she gave a fantastic interview where she talked about how to resist Trump without taking him seriously. Mm-hmm. And she really has a clear sense that laughing at Trump and his inability to govern is OK. We need yeah. to be resisting the results of his presidency over and over. That means, yeah, yeah, sue him. Yeah, stop him. Yeah, protest him. Yes, uh, elect people who will uh, resist him and and vote him out of office. Absolutely all of that. But when it comes to the sort of quotidian day-to-day outrage after outrage and, and getting caught up in the fake drama that he is creating as a man baby who is manipulating all of us because he's good at that. Uh, yeah, well, that's not helpful. It's, I have many thoughts. <laughs> well, good. Let's just start anywhere. Part of this is, um, if this were someone on the L mm-hmm. in Chicago, you would change, you would change uh, cars. Right. You'd move away from them. You'd you'd call the conductor. You'd have them escorted off. If they got violent, you'd take matters into your own hands. But you, you wouldn't put up with this shit on public transportation. The shit from shit but that Donald Trump is doing, or shit Donald okay. Trump yeah. does. The, the the raving, racist, lying, constant, constant, constant. Today was a perfect example. Just one rambling, pathological, racist rant uh, today. Uh, that was probably the most unhinged thing I've heard him say in in, in the Rose Garden. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it just disgraced the office, disgraced the country, embarrassed everyone who who, and is backed up by the same kind of flunkies and acolytes and stooges and hangers on and grifters. I have to imagine we're down in the bunker with Hitler during the final mm-hmm. days. It was just these are the the worst of the worst people, and the worst of the worst people are a third of this country. That's the terrifying part. So. Uh, Donald Trump controls the media. It's, it's not that he's a genius. You know, it's like saying I control traffic by lobbing cinder blocks mm-hmm, into traffic. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, of course I do. I stand up on an overpass and I toss bricks into traffic. I control the traffic flow. And then the police come and take me away. But there is no one taking him away. Right. There's no one stopping him. There's, there's certainly his his complicit um, thug criminal scumbag party aren't stopping him. Uh, the media is not stopping him. So there is he will continue to uh, get away with inflicting himself on the rest of us until he is dragged by his hair out of office. And that's just the way it's going to be. There is no way to stop him because all the mechanisms in place to stop him are being destroyed by the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. So that leaves the question of how do you engage these people? Um, this week did by happenstance, this happens to me a lot, frankly, now that we're, now that I live in Trump country. Yeah. Um, it, it's weird. Uh, the person I engaged with this week, uh, we were talking about some, uh, something, some habit this person had broken, uh, 
well, cigarettes, exactly. You can say it. Yeah, she quit that, smoking. Right. She quit smoking, and, and which would have been a fine story. I quit smoking, and I feel better. I quit smoking because Pat Quinn and those tax and spend Democrats raised the price of doing that. And I said, screw those people. But it was, oh, you just – this is all you are all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's the first fucking thing out of your mouth. And this really does remind me uh, – this is like the third time I've told the story – of uh, Henry Ford at his factory with his, with his subordinate at a candy machine. And the subordinate is, is, you know, buying a candy bar and he's staying there with him. It's after hours. There's almost nobody there. And Henry Ford gets his candy bar and it's like the boss is here. It's like standing next to, you know, Jeff Bezos. Right. Um, the guy who's like 50 levels above you and owns everything and his name's on everything. And Ford takes the candy bar and takes a bite out of it. And he just goes, these just aren't as good as they used to be. Right. And the employee goes, I suppose so. He goes, goddamn Jews ruin everything. <laughs> Like, it's, wait, I didn't even know where that came from. Right. And, and it was the same thing. Like, wow, Pat Quinn helped you quit smoking by raising right. the price of a pack of cigarettes. Right. What well, not he awesome? Isn't well, and <laughs> No, that's not I what you meant. <laughs> but first and foremost in the it is uppermost in the in the Republican mind that mm-hmm. everything is the fault of Barack Obama. Everything right. is the fault of Democrats. Yeah. And they it's just constant this 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 bile and rage and paranoia and stupidity is boiling in their brains all the time and this and that when you manifest that physically it looks like donald trump mm-hmm. so the, so mm-hmm. there really is no way to engage them that's productive there just isn't it, it these are people who need to be taken out of the electoral equation mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they 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 simply cannot govern and our problem is I, I'm convinced of this. You, you're never going to stop these people from voting. You're never going to stop them from behaving horribly. Uh, the only place we have any hope of affecting anything is at the inflection point between them and everybody else. And the inflection point between them and everybody else is the media. How does the media describe um, these people? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Do they describe white men with guns as domestic terrorists? No, they do not. Do they describe um, right wing fundamentalist Christians as um, as extremists? They do not. Do they describe the Republican Party as a freak show, outlier, racist, dung heap, or some combination thereof? They do not. Right. They simply will not treat this third of the population that is unrecoverably insane as unrecoverably insane. They won't do it. They just won't do it. And until an enormous amount of professional agony is inflicted on the people who make that decision, this is never going to change. Mm-hmm. It's only going to get worse. And that's where I have my disagreement over the how we treat never Trumpers. Right, right. Uh, because Can, it, can it, I insert one thing in addition to what you've just said? Charles Blow had a tweet earlier this month that struck me. Uh, Uh He said, if you still ignore, support, or defend Trump racism at this point, you two are a racist. Yeah. I don't care if you are a cheerful grandma who bakes cookies for the children's Sunday school class. You two. And and then his hashtag is there is no middle ground. And I think that was what you said to me when we discussed talking about Fred Rogers in our when we were putting our show notes together, which mm-hmm. is, you know, this is a polarized country and it's polarized mm-hmm. over race. It's polarized over politics, but mostly it's polarized over race. And mm-hmm. so and fear, you know, fear I get for, that's why I felt chided about Fred Rogers. I felt ch- mm-hmm. chided by Fred Rogers because he gets that fear is uh, not a natural condition of the human being at its best. <laughs> and right. if we can right. work to dispel fear, we can improve the human condition. And I believe that. Well, well, he was and he was working with children. Yeah, he was he was telling grownups mm-hmm. who care about children right. how children need to be. Uh, cared for and protected right. and told that they're safe. And, and he, he, and he talked to children at their level, not, not dumbing down, but he talked to them about what they were afraid of. Right. 
and and he got them to, to to speak to these things. And honestly, he was also dealing in a political universe. He was the guy who turned the tables for PBS when they went to uh, get funding from Congress. Uh, the guy who was holding all the cards had no inclination of giving them a dime. He was looking for money to cut, and he personally changed this guy's mind. When was the last time you heard of anyone in the Republican Party changing their mind about anything? Right. Uh, right. Newt Gingrich changed his mind. He remember he did a commercial with Nancy Pelosi about global warming. He did, and now it's it's what never said that, and that's that's the difference. He was lived in a different political time, and he, he was talking to children and people who care about children and why adults should care, care about children and how they should be treated. There is no way to reach Newt Gingrich. Yeah, well, there's no way to reach a political party that believes that refugee children should be put in cages as a deterrent for refugees arriving on our shores. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, <laughs> now, I, now I'm starting to get mad and I, I, I feel my body tensing up because babies in cages does that to me. I want to be a listener. I want to be able to communicate with anyone who wants to have a conversation, mm -hmm. but you're right. 31% of the American populace is brainwashed they at are. this point. And they did it to themselves. And they did, and it, they to did it to themselves. They, I, that came to me this morning. No one is forcing anyone to watch Fox News. Nope. Nope. Uh, it, and I don't know how to stop that, except, as you say, to attack the center and to, to those people who pretend, David Brooks, I don't know what they say on Fox News. You know, I just don't know. That's not my party. Yeah. That's not my you thing. Know. And and we really need to be more humble. Yeah. Nobody listens to Rush Limbaugh. That's a hand wave, yeah, hand wave, no, hand no, wave. No. Yeah. 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 The president and of the United States name-checked Limbaugh and Hannity today yes, as, he did. as his guys. Only the best people on his uh, kitchen cabinet, right? And we know who they are. We know what he does during executive time. He plays fake golf and listens to Hannity and Limbaugh and and they elected one of their own. That's they what did. they did. They did. Who listens to no one but them? Right. And and I will I will not preview my conversation with Bob Seska next week. No, don't do that because no, we want everyone that, to listen to Bob. Right. That would be wrong. But I will say this: if you are a, a liberal and you've made it this far in this podcast, and <laughs> and you sort of you're hip to the fact that the Republican Party has been fucked up for a really long time. Not just the last two years or five years or 10 years, but decades. The Republican Party has been this fucked up for a really long time. Then you, then the next – just ask the next logical question. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. How did it happen that this fucked up, awful, dung heap of a racist party get to be the way it is? I mean that's a pretty reasonable question to ask. And then you go back over the history of the Republican Party, and there, there are large checkpoints and milestones and small ones, but you can just see it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And they, everything they touch, they destroy. And then Democrats get into office to try to clean up their shit. And Republic, the same people who wrecked it now sabotage Democrats. And then they run against Democrats as being you know overlords and monsters and murderers and communists. And they get back into power and they wreck it again. And they fuck it up to the point where it's almost unrecoverable. We elect Barack Obama, who tries really hard to fix their shit but, and tries to really hard to play nice with everybody and be a good centrist, and they go right after him. They go right after him, sabotaging everything he does, calling him a Kenyan monster, the whole birther thing. It's a cycle, and it's a cycle that is mm -hmm. as clear and obvious and repeated as the tides. So the question is, how is it in 2019, if you are a Republican who's making special pleading – that you didn't know. How the fuck did you not know? You either did know and you were complicit, in which case you're lying, or you didn't know, in which case you're an idiot and no one should listen to you. Certainly no one should buy your books. But the larger lesson is, if you let the cycle continue, it will always get worse. The, mm -hmm. the transition mm -hmm. from Reagan Bush to Clinton was very bad. From Clinton to mm -hmm. George W. Bush was really bad. George W. Bush to Obama was two wars, one of which we were lied into and was fucking up, a crash global economy, a New Orleans drowned, all, you know, the whole laundry list. And the mm -hmm. transition from right. Obama to Trump was the end of the republic. This is a cycle that must be broken. And, if, and the only way 
they have gotten away with it so far is because every time they fuck up, they are allowed to get away with it. They're allowed to, They're allowed to pretend they yep. never saw it. They never happened. I was never there. I never touched it. I never voted for Bush. I'm an independent. I'm a conservative. And if you are a liberal and you are allowing never Trumpers to pretend they had no idea that you are fucking complicit. Don't let them in the guest room. And ask yourself, ask yourself a really obvious question. Mm -hmm. Why are these people so fucking terrified of answering really basic questions about who they are, how they got there, what their role in this was, and what they plan to do about it? Why are you so terrified of asking them really basic questions? You would never let a Republican, a full-blown, full-colored Republican, get away with this shit. Mm -hmm. If you had an opportunity right. to, to cross-examine Hugh Hewitt, wouldn't you push him really hard on things? Why are you letting the people who you goddamn well know made a, 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 a fortune off of calling you a traitor and a liar and un-American for a long time, why are you letting them slide? Because the last time we let them slide, we got the Tea Party. The time before that, we got mm -hmm. the entire Clinton witch hunt universe every time you let them get away with murder they they come back twice as strong and twice as angry and twice as ready to do twice as much damage mm -hmm. so ask yourself mm -hmm. what is it about you that you will not ask your good never trump buddies really basic questions and when they blow you off you sort of giggle and say well i guess this is okay what's yeah. wrong yeah. with you yeah and are you so desperate for validation that you will throw yourself at anybody who tells you you're pretty? Because if that's the case, fine. But just say that. Just say, I'm so desperate to see good in them that I'm willing to overlook the fact that they are unrepentant and unreformed, that the only thing that they are uh, that we agree on is we both hate Trump. And the minute Trump is gone, you know goddamn well they're going to go to work for Romney or Rubio yep. or Cruz or somebody, and, and the knife's going to be stuck in and your And start back. working on a grand bargain right. to get rid of your Social that's Security. Right. That's the thing that gets – that's why I won't invite them into my guest room or into my house. The, the never Trumpers, they're careerists. Yes. And they want to be a legitimate, uh, sanctified voice, mm -hmm. talking head mm – -hmm on cable news that pays $80,000 a year and that's going to get their kids through college and that's their job. So that when Trump is out of favor or Trump is intellectually out of favor in New York City and Washington, D.C., you're not going to insult your own intelligence. I get that. That's a good motive. Sure. Not, I'm not going to insult my own intelligence by defending Trump. I'm going to call out my own party. Good for mm -hmm. you. That's great. That does not mean that you get a buffet at my table uh, and a thank you for me for noticing that your party has gone rogue in nominating Trump. Mm -hmm. Because you don't get to the, do that. You don't get anything from me for that. And the way you can tell is, are they hiding out in the center? Yes, right, right. Uh, after the Bush, this every liberal should know this. This is this is why we our our superpower is memory. Every liberal knows this. Mm -hmm. After the Bush administration fell apart. All of the Bush stooges, all the Bill Crystals and the Michael Gersons and the David Frums, the David Brookses, they all hit out where? In the high and holy church of both sides do it. The both mm -hmm. sides are terrible. Right. Both sides are bad. Both sides are awful. That's how they got away with it. They Well, and there was also an, an undercurrent of that, a real concerted effort to hide the fact for at least two mm -hmm. years that the Tea Party was not just Republicans with new right. clothes on. It was a... Media it, was, conspiracy. it was it was a new, brand new there was a brand new movement you know the the tea party was a brand new movement it was not a glenn beck fan party although anyone with eyes could see that that's exactly why everyone was coming to these rallies mm -hmm. was they were listening to glenn beck who by the way was paid a million dollars to promote the tea party right fox news had l free coverage of every tea party rally uh, the ones that were held on april 14th of 2009 april 15th of 2009 as tax protests and deficit protests were not were not that at all they were a rebranding of the republican mm -hmm. party and uh we can't let them get away with it again because and and this is where i think you and i differ a little bit in approach not in result but in mm -hmm. approach because you look backwards and say we know who these people are and i look forwards and say we know who these people will yes. be yes. they will be pushing i mean these are people that 
were perfectly okay with vote after vote, 60, 60, 70 votes against my health right. insurance. Take it away from you. When it didn't mean anything because Obama was going to veto right. it. But they were fine with those votes. They were fine with that being a position. And, and once Trump is gone, they are going to be in the seat on cable TV to manipulate the conversation to, well, the Republican Party has to go in a new direction now. And once that happens, and this is the, the – no, we don't disagree because every liberal knows how this movie ends. Exactly. Every one of you has been exactly. through this at least twice, possibly three or four times already. And if you know how this ends, why are you helping them do it? Why are you – Right. Don't don't participate in the script writing of so, this. We have to disrupt it. Yes. Right. So the question then is – if you know how this is going to end and you know who the players are, what are you doing about it? What what action are you yeah. taking? I have nothing against genuinely repentant people at all, but it's mind-boggling to me that Max Boot, a couple of days ago, <laughs> is in the Washington Post saying that we have to look out for the loony left, just as bad as the right. <laughs> and the first line of his fucking story is, as I tell people on my book tour... Okay, so you're yeah. using your Washington Post column to pimp your book and to warn liberals not to become like the Republican Party, which they're in danger of doing. They're, they're just right no, on the verge they're of not. doing it. No, they're really and not. If they succeed, <laughs> if they succeed in this, it will be Charlie Sykes and Bill Kristol will be the center of American politics. Yeah, and that's why they're holding on to that seat on the television. Exactly. And Republic, the Republican Party will have succeeded in hauling the Overton window so far to the right, we will never get it back. Yep. Because if if Charlie Sykes and Bill Kristol and Joe Scarborough are now the reasonable center of American politics, we're fucked. And it's not too late to fix it, but you have to keep, every time you get the chance to ask them a straight up question about who they were, who they are. How did you not know your party was full of Republicans? Uh, all this time, yep. they're all sticking to the same alibi. They're at, the reason that we're not allowed to talk to them is because, and this is the reason why um, never Trumpers block me, mm -hmm. but they don't block, you know, four follower rubes on, on Twitter and, and mock people who do yeah. because they can't take a punch from someone like me. That's true. They are they're perfectly happy to sit all day long and and thump on rubes and maga hats and morons all day long. And they're perfectly happy to mock people who block them. But right. they But anyone who actually remembers and can bring receipts have, to their career are so fucking terrified. Are, are kryptonite. Right. Absolutely. Kryptonite. And they shouldn't yep. be. They shouldn't be. If what they are saying is true, if they're really... If they're genuine. If they're genuine. Yep. If they're genuine. They should, they should yeah. have no problem having this conversation. The fact they're terrified of having this discussion means that tells me all, all I need to know about them. Well, it's about the paycheck. It is about right. the paycheck and the access and the power. Yeah. Uh, we got to get to other stuff. Like, like there's this uh, so-called attorney named Alan Dershowitz who has opinions about the Constitution yeah. of the United yeah. States. The Constitution, is <laughs> the Constitution of the United States is, is grossly unconstitutional, according to Alan Dershowitz. <laughs> uh, every student who's ever had Alan Dershowitz should march right back to the law school and demand your money back because he's yeah. obviously yeah. nuts. Um, yeah, no, Alan Dershowitz, now, again, now that he's getting paid – by Donald Trump. Now that mm -hmm. that money's coming to him from mm -hmm. Donald Trump, suddenly the 25th Amendment to the Constitution is unconstitutional. Um, well, and he says it's reserved for people that are, uh, you know, disabled by a stroke, right. like Woodrow Wilson was. Ha and I just pointed out on another post today that have, is, has there ever been a weaker non-functional presidency since Woodrow Wilson? I will take Woodrow Wilson. That is as bad as Donald Trump. I will take Trump. the racist Woodrow Wilson with a stroke. Over Donald Trump any yep. day. Yep. Um, yep. And by the way, where his where his wife was running the White House because there was no twenty. And Wilson was an and awful that's, president. That is, yeah. Or, was an, yeah, he was he racist. Was a, Absolutely. Straight up Klan loving racist. Um, but Alan Dershowitz thinks that the twenty fifth amendment is reserved for presidents who who are not paying Alan Dershowitz. That's true. That's true. Ann Coulter's having either a very, very good week or a very, very yeah. bad week for her brand. I'm not yeah. quite sure which. Time will tell. But uh, the author of In Trump We Trust <laughs> no longer trusts Trump. And is uh, there are, again, there are liberals out there who are retweeting Ann Coulter. 
block Ann yeah. Coulter, yeah. would you please just yeah. block her? That's what you need to do. Although the best headline this week is from The Onion, of course. Uh-huh. Uh, Ann Coulter attacks Trump for cowardly backing down on full-on race war. It's funny because it's true. It's absolutely <laughs> true. It's absolutely <laughs> true. And these are the people who run the Republican Party. And, yeah. and they have... They have the firm backing and agreement of 90% of the base and pretty much the entire congressional delegation. This I don't know who – I don't know what imaginary Republican Party people who continue to hold out hope uh, are dreaming of, but this is the Republican Party. This is who they always have been. This is who they are now. And even after Donald Trump is a, is a distant, stinky memory, this is who they will be. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is the thing we have to fight, not the titular leader of this lunatic party, but the, the core of it. And this, and the people who run the party are Ann Coulter, uh, Sean Hannity, and Rush Limbaugh, and everybody knows it. And I, I know I'm going to regret asking you this question, Drip Glass, but did Eric Erickson have any rationale for getting back on the Donald Trump trail, other than Democrats are terrible? He he cut my taxes, he cut taxes and abortion and judges. You know what? I'm back on the Trump train. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Because That's it. It's just because he hates Democrats so badly, he won't. He will never. Because yeah. he's a pious man of God. Oh God. God! That's why. Because he's a he's a Christian man. Enough. And who? <laughs> what greater champion of Christian values yeah. is there than Donald fucking Trump? That's why. Because he's Eric. He's a Republican. He's Eric Erickson. All right. Let's do a news roundup, Drift Glass. Well, let, let's let's do a little bit of good news. Oh yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, this is part of our news roundup anyway. Uh, uh -huh. The Illinois State House passed a $15 minimum wage by 2025. The uh, minimum wage in Illinois will be $15 an hour, and it's going to go up pretty quickly uh, yep. right away. And uh, the governor, our Democratic governor, is going to sign that into law. So I believe uh, this was SB1. So yeah. I believe this is the first bill out of, the, out of yep. the consolidated Democratic Party, and it's you know minimum wage. Uh, there, there's a lot of carping on local talk radio and newspaper about how it's going to destroy local businesses. Uh, to date, uh, no minimum wage increase has ever destroyed businesses. Nope. It's just something that people say. Nope. Uh, but you sorry. Know, businesses that are doing well and busy um, are already paying nine twenty five an hour. And yeah. so, uh, no. Yeah. that And I know that from having a quote-unquote minimum wage worker, 16-year-old in our house that uh, – yes. Who, is, who works in retail and is learning why turnover in retail is so high because she wants yeah. to change jobs. Oh. But every job that she's applying for is above the quote unquote minimum wage because that's yeah. what the, in, in certain areas, that's what the market will bear. So getting everyone up to a, what is still below what it would be if we had matched it to inflation. And that's what we should do. We should, right. nationwide, it should just be, minimum wage should be, linked to inflation, period. Yeah. All right. Uh, a federal judge ruled that Paul Manafort, our old friend Paul Manafort, violated oh, the terms cool. of his cooperation deal. What did he do before that? He was Trump's what? Campaign manager. That's what he was. Oh, Paulie, oh, won't see him no more. Uh, yeah. He violated yeah. the terms of his cooperation deal with Robert Mueller by repeatedly lying to Robert Mueller and a grand jury about his interactions and communications with Konstantin Kalimnik, uh, the, a longtime aide who the FBI assessed to have ties to Russian intelligence. And uh, Drew Clash, you are convinced that uh, whether or not Paul Manafort gets a pardon from Donald Trump his real fear is uh, the Russian Secret Service, right? <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, you know he's he he owes money to the mob. Yep. Okay. Let, let, let's put it very simply and clearly. And uh, while the FBI won't go after your family, the Russian mob will. And I'm just wondering too if this means if this uh, shredding of his cooperation deal means that the uh, Mueller people will go after the rest of his townhouses and condos and things that he was allowed to keep in the cooperation deal. Cause that was, I would part of what he said was his motivation uh -huh. was to protect my family and make sure they have a roof or two or three over their heads. And yeah. I think he was able to keep two of his residences of the seven that he owned, uh, for his family as a result of the cooperation deal. I'll be real interested to see whether that, just gets mm -hmm. put away too. All right. And Donald Trump is drastically slashing the size of the two teams of federal officers, uh, officials who were supposed to be fighting 
election interference by foreign countries. Uh, this task force is part of the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Agency, and they were assembled in response to Russian interference in the 2016 election. You know, the Russian interference that Paul Manafort helped execute. Mm-hmm. One of those task forces is now half the size that it was a few months ago, and there are no indications that anyone in, in senior political leadership plans to rebuild it. So they are lowering the drawbridge yeah. and letting the same people who fucked over the election in 2016 right back into the castle because that's the only way they survive. Trump called for the Tennessee Valley Authority to keep an aging coal plant open that buys coal from a company chaired by a leading donor to Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Drain the swamp. Drain the swamp. Drain the swamp. Clean coal. It's clean coal. It's beautiful, (laughs) sweet, sweet clean coal. I eat it every day. That's why I use the picture of hell. He eats coal and cheeseburgers uh, all day long. And in the evening, he goes to his... Brand new $50,000 room-sized golf simulator in the White House, which allows him to just fuck around even more than he already has been. Laziest president ever, cheapest president ever, most grifting president ever, uh, most taking time off for golf ever. And the next project, I understand, is a full-scale reality simulator. <laughs> that will let him good. just sit in there <laughs> and, watch, and watch Ann Coulter uh, win the vice presidency and Sean uh-huh. Hannity be appointed uh-huh. regent or whatever uh-huh. the fuck amuses him this day, uh-huh. which would actually work out well. If there were a matrix in which you could just plug this guy yeah, um, that let him kept keep believing that he was president and then, and it was actually the back of a van and you just sort of drove it slowly away. I'd be for that. <laughs> uh, that's fine. Well, it's if you it's let clear him... that a large number of his voters are already plugged into that. So, uh, yeah. you know. Well, so are the rest of us. That's the, the problem. Wall, I, yeah. That just tells you that. Uh... Wall's finished, honey. <laughs> it's 20,000 miles long. It's made of mithril. It's invisible. And it'll cost $3 trillion. And, and he got the money. He, gonna pay he, for cut, it. he cut budgets to, to pay for it. Mexico paid for it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, this is an amazing story. Uh, The new attorney general, William Barr, who was confirmed by the Senate this week. Today, I think. Yesterday. 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 Uh, His son-in-law just landed a job advising Trump on legal issues. Drain the swamp. Drain the swamp. Tyler. His name's Tyler. Tyler McGawkey? Is that how you say his name? McGawkey? You're asking. I I know it's an Irish name. I know I should know. Tyler McGawkey. Let's just say McGawkey. Yeah, McGawkey. His work will, quote, unquote, intersect with the Russia investigation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Had yeah. to vanity fear on that story. But, oh, my gosh. Son-in-laws, and, you know, they always get work. He and Clarence Thomas's wife will have many uh, a Mai Tai to talk about <laughs> how, how, fu- how cool it is to be a Republican. Because yeah. it doesn't matter what we do. Nobody's going to make a stop because we're Republicans. Yeah. And everything's okay if you're a Republican. Uh, and finally, or more or less finally, a BBC cameraman was violently pushed and shoved by a Trump supporter at Trump's shitty little rally in El Paso. Uh, a, a lunatic in a MAGA hat, surprise, surprise, was screaming, fuck the media, after attempting to knock the BBC cameraman, a guy named Ron Skians, off balance while he was filming Trump's speech. This is now normal at these Nuremberg rallies. Um, if you watch any excerpts of them, it, it it's two minutes hate mm-hmm. from from 1984. It's Donald Trump screaming about murder and murder and babies being ripped from the bodies of mothers and being murdered and the murderers coming up from the border who duct tape women and kill them and rape them and it's just it's hate porn right. for morons and the condensed terrifying version of that was the speech that Donald Trump gave in the Rose Garden today. It was there, there it was completely delusional. Um, you know, Charlie Pierce says something about this guy is now lost in his own nightmares. Yep. Yep. Um, and he's dragging the rest of us along with him. And 70% of this country want him to stop doing that. And 30% of this country thinks he's a hero. And that's the problem. And uh, Beto O'Rourke held a uh, rally at the same time that Donald Trump's El Paso rally was going on. I hope he continues to sure. do that. Just go around the country but, and hold an alternate rally next to Trump's. But. But did Beto O'Rourke get permission from the fire department to let a trillion people in, Blue Gal? No. <laughs> Open the borders no, and let not. a trillion people come to his rally. Well, I want to yeah. read a tweet that at Tmoyer09 wrote, uh, Tammy is sure. her name. Sure, rub my face in it, honey. Yeah, okay. Rub my face Tammy in it. Tammy wrote this tweet. Yeah. 
We're arguing about crowd size when we have a sitting president who might be colluding with the Russians. Don't get distracted. What did Trump know and when did he know it? Trump must be investigated for treason. If guilty, he must be imprisoned. She yeah. wrote that tweet on January 21st of 2017, and nothing has changed. So, no. again, I go back to uh, Stacey Abrams. Resist Trump. Don't get caught up in the drama of Trump. I think that's it's hard to do, but uh, to, that's going to be my goal. Uh well, and, and one of the, I mean, one of the things right on that subject, one of the things that just got swept aside mm -hmm. during the news days, Andrew McCabe had a book. Yes, which is coming out on Sunday. The interview is going to be fully released yeah. on Sunday. Right, right. Well, and it deserves, every one of these subjects really deserves like an hour, at least an hour of discussion on its own. That's mm -hmm. how fast things are coming. Yeah. But the, the short version of it is that, yes, Donald Trump is a pathological liar and incompetent and, and he's a casual racist and Jeff Sessions is pathologically racist yep. and a coward. And they and they really did talk about, um, in a serious way, whether or not they could get the 25th Amendment invoked because mm -hmm. Donald Trump is so much of an existential threat to this country right. and he continues to be so. And again, the Republican voters and Republican office holders like the fact that he's wrecking this country. Yeah. And Republican media likes it, too. Yeah, yep. they love it. They love it. Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Luna. And I've showed you Luna's picture. Luna is definitely yeah. related to our own Zeppo as a tabby yeah. with a white scarf and white boots. Uh, Luna is a beautiful cat. And we invite you to visit Luna at our Facebook page and website. You can send your internet kitty to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. A shout out to the Denver Teachers Union as well. They had a strike this week and they won, and uh, we're very proud of them. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job, and we do appreciate your donations. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Our PayPal postal address information and all of it is there at proleftpod.com. If you are writing us a check, it gets made out to Professional Left Podcast. I need to let everybody know that. Yeah, there was a little glitch this week. Yeah. Please share our show on social media. And thank you so much for doing that. Again, I'm rubbing Driftless's face in it. But, you know, he, he'll be you. back. I hate you all. He'll be back. I'm going to Snapchat. I'm never coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Driftless. I love you too, darling. Yeah, 11 years we've known each other face to face. I know. It's just so, so strange. It seems like 11 years. Yeah. Yeah. 11 wonderful, 11 wonderful. 11 really years. wonderful years. Thank you mm -hmm. for those. Mm -hmm. And on to the next. Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties have never heard of Ann Coulter either, and they'd like to keep it that way. Let's think about living. Think about living. Let's think about loving. Think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, loving. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, DGBG Productions Incorporated.